I received a very important lesson in my first year of salvation that I want to share with you today. So I'm going to give you a whole load of principles from Matthew chapter 4. But before we get into that scripture, there's two words I want to talk to you about. And the first word is this word process. Someone say process. When we go through a process, we're going through a series of tests until completion. Process is the training ground. It's the space between our past and our future. It's the space between who we are now and our potential in the future. Many of us want to be the finished product, but we don't want to go through process. Someone say process. Process is something that's not fun. We love the promises of God. We decree and we declare God's promises, but process is what gives us the promise and the finished product that we want. Amen? So we must go through process in order to get our promise. Am I making sense in this church? The second word I want to speak to you about is a word, wilderness. Someone say wilderness. If you've been saved, my experience and what the Bible shows is that every single believer goes through a honeymoon period where they're praying God is answering quickly. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Then all of a sudden, you end up in this dry place, the wilderness. Am I speaking in here? So the wilderness is a place where we actually get very spiritually dry, very moody, very depressed. It's the place where we feel like God is not with us. Raise your hands if you felt like that before. Praise God. Anyone feeling like that now? Be real, please. I want to know who this word's for. Okay. I personally had a very amazing honeymoon period in my faith. God took, God took away so much unforgiveness, so much bitterness, so much hurt, so much rage. I was free. Then I went into this low season and I didn't actually understand why it happened. I felt like I'd done something wrong. Am I making sense in there? And the wilderness experience, when you go into that place, it doesn't mean you've done anything bad. It actually means that you're normal. Can someone say normal? So I don't feel like we teach the wilderness enough. I don't feel like we talk about what this place accomplishes. But the wilderness, that dry place that you're feeling is the processing ground. It's, it, it's the place, it's the airport where they go to check your passport, to check your ID. And we can remain stuck in immigration control. We can remain stuck where they're checking our ID and we never walk out into the promised land. The wilderness, the Israelites spent 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus spent 40 days. So many of us are stuck at checking and customs and baggage control that we don't even walk out into our promise. So the wilderness is that process in place. Salvation is you boarding a plane to get to another um, destination. Salvation is you boarding something to get from your past into your future. But once you uh, move from your past to your future, when you land, they have to scan your passport. They have to scan your ID at the, at the airport. Am I making sense? And when you get to that place, the, the borders and check-ins, they have to ask you questions. They have to interrogate you and ask you questions before you can walk into your promise. Am I making sense in this church? So the wilderness is the check-in area for you to get to your promise. They have to see if you are right to be a citizen of the kingdom. Deuteronomy 8.2 And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you. Someone say humble. Testing you, someone say test. Testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. The wilderness is the place where God is testing your identity. But the wilderness is also the place where Satan is tempting your identity. So God is testing your identity. Satan is tempting your identity. If we don't speak about the wilderness, you're going to be stuck there for 40 years where you can get out in 40 days. So we're going to crack this open today. I'm going to give you a very powerful lesson on identity. And my sermon title is Processed ID. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, please. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit. Who led, spirit? Who, who led Jesus? Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Who led him? Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, process. You see, if you claim to be mature as a Christian and you haven't passed this test, you're bluffing. The devil's coming to tempt and God is watching to see if you overcome the test. Next verse. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. 
Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, It is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, someone say again. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all of these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone. Someone say be gone. Be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then this is where the tension is. The devil left him. And behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Turn to your neighbor. Look at them longingly, point your finger in their face and say, are you processed? Today we're, today we're actually going to, I truly do believe this word will bless you. God wants to flex his muscles and he wants to flex by processing you. We love it when God's blessing us, when he gives us opportunities, a job or a spouse. We love the God that blesses us. But what about the God who tells you to leave your net? What about the God that tells you to leave your spouse? What about the God that tells you to leave your mother and father's house? What about the God that tells you to leave Egypt? The beginning of discipleship is departure and hopping onto that plane to go to check-in and customs. We love the God that does stuff for us, but what about the God that does stuff in us? God wants to do something for every single person inside this room that is called promise. And God has an idea and a goal and a plan for every single one in this room. And his plan is to get glory out of you. He wants to use your past. He wants to use your mistakes, your flaws, your parents, your school. He wants to use all of that to contribute to a powerful story where he can get the glory. The lowly things to shame the wise, the weak to shame the strong. God's glory doesn't exclude any detail of your life. He gets glory out of what you do right. He gets glory out of what you do wrong. He gets glory out of normal stories. He gets glory out of bizarre stories. He gets glory out of those who grew up in church. He gets glory out of those who didn't grow up in church. He gets glory out of the old. He gets glory out of the young. The bottom line is this. God is going to get glory. It doesn't matter if you fight it. It doesn't matter if you run away from it. It doesn't matter if you rebel. God is going to get the glory one way, shape or another. He's going to get the glory if you fight. He's going to get the glory when you reconcile. He's going to get the glory when you have children. He's going to get the glory when your children smoke weed. My mom went through pain and today she is getting the glory through me because all things work together for the good of those who love God. God is going to get the glory. And his glory doesn't only mean that he's going to get the glory out of your testimony. He wants to get the glory out of your process. He wants to get the glory out of your growth. Many people get saved, but who continues into destiny? Process and growth is God's plan for your life. And process hurts. Pruning hurts. Pruning hurts. And the Lord isn't there like some psychopath, like giggling at your pain. He's not doing that. Many of us go through painful experiences and we wonder why God hasn't pulled us out of that experience. But let me give you some language to this pain that you feel. God isn't looking at the pain that you're going through. He's looking at his promise. He isn't looking at Joseph who gets betrayed by his brothers. He isn't looking at Joseph with Potiphar's wife. He isn't looking at Joseph being imprisoned. He's looking at the promise of Joseph becoming the second in command. God is looking at his promise. He's not looking at your pain. He's not looking at what you're going through the present. He's looking at your finished product. So when you're going through the pain, God's not there giggling at your pain. When he looks at you, he looks at you from the future. He doesn't look at you where you are right now. He looks at you from how you're going to be in the future. So he isn't looking at Joseph going through pain in the moment. He's not looking at you in your pain in the moment. He's looking at the promise of your life. Someone say promise. God isn't looking at your ouch. He's not looking at your get me out right now. He's not looking at your hurry up. He's looking at you and saying, I'm going to get glory out of this. And so many of us tap out of the training pro process prematurely. And we opt out of God's plan for our lives because we don't like the pain of growth. So what we do is we stay at the check-in at the airport. And we stay in cycles arguing with border control. Whilst other people are in the kingdom enjoying the promises of the kingdom, others are stuck at border control arguing with the immigration officer who is the devil. Oh, we're going to make this make sense today. We're, we're, we're going to make this make sense today. I've come to tell you that God is going to process you over the next hundred days to get glory out of you. Over the next hundred days, God is going to begin to process you in Jesus' name. And it's not going to feel great. Oh yeah, you want to receive that? It's not going to feel great. <laughs> 40 days, let's do it. I'm going to work this text now. 
I'm going to work this text and we're going to pull some principles out of it. We are all either coming out of a process, we're in a process, or we're going into a process. And the Bible says from glory to glory, faith to faith, strength to strength, in other words, from process to process. This feels good. There are no shortcuts with God. And, and your procrastination is in the way of God getting glory out of you. And I'm slowly creeping to Matthew 4. You may feel like you're under attack right now, but it's not an attack. God has you at immigration control and you're being questioned. And he's recruited a teacher that's going to tempt you to flunk your test. He's recruited a teacher for your sake because he's going to use everything that he can to process your identity. When God's decided to process you, he will use your enemy to get you to the next level. He's going to say, Satan, I need you for a moment. There's a greater good in Lewis. There's deeper power in Ben. He's going to say there's a deep, there's deeper potential in Xavier. And he's not going to know his potential unless I can get him to overcome you. So have you tried my servant Job? I want you to walk up on him and throw everything you have against him. Because after this process, after he passes this test, he's going to walk into my promise. Am I making sense in this church? I love the silence, but you guys need to be charismatic with me. Someone shout process. We know what we're called to, but we opt out of the process. I want to say that your marriage is in process. Your business is in process. COVID has been a process. Your rap career is a process. Everything's in process. Your emotions are in a process. And you have to have the pain tolerance for the next level of success that you want. Success that you want. We can't quit at this easy level of questioning your identity. We can't quit at this level of temptation. If we quit at this level of temptation and keep giving it into porn, you're not going to be able to minister to that beautiful woman that you see in the future. Forty-five minutes isn't enough to tell you what you need to do when you're in temptation. But let me tell you something, that prayer doesn't fix every temptation. When I'm starting to feel lonely and I want to cuddle someone and I try to talk in tongues and it doesn't work and I scroll online and I go on Instagram and I see a bad one and, and let me tell you right now that your thinking can be trained. You need to hear me on this. Your thinking can be trained. If dogs can be trained, if cats can be trained, if your ways can be trained, if you can be potty trained, if, if, if you can train to read, if you can train to speak, if you can train all of those things, then guess what? Sexuality can be trained. This isn't a prayer issue, it's a discipline issue. We can't quit at this level of pain. If we cry and spill milk at every single test, then we don't deserve the seat that we're going to have. If our emotional strength is not enough to handle the accusations of people, if I can't handle this critic and keep it moving, if I can't handle the fake around me, how can I handle the fake in the nations? We have to learn to be fueled by this level of persecution. Get under the baptism of suffering. Consider it all joy when you experience trials of many kinds. Rejoice when you're persecuted for my name's sake. He is testing your identity. Praise the Lord. When you sit under process, you're not afraid of no one. Paul said, what can man do to me? He ain't afraid of wolves, he's not afraid of snakes, he's not afraid of fakes, he's not afraid of pigeons, he's not even afraid of the devil. I'm in process. And God loves you so much that he wants to get the flesh out of you so he can watch Jesus manifest in the core of you. It's process. Someone say process. Even Jesus couldn't escape process. Hebrews 5 eight, please. Jesus couldn't escape process. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Jesus couldn't escape process. The temperature's right. Now we can preach. I'm going to give you 11 principles on how to pass border control, immigration, temptation, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to give you 11 principles on how to defeat the enemy's temptation so you can walk into the kingdom, into the promised land. Praise the Lord. In the backdrop of Matthew 4, Jesus has just been baptized and the heavens open and God says, this is my son whom I love. In him I'm well pleased. At this point in the story, Jesus hasn't grabbed a mic. He hasn't cast out a demon. He hasn't done anything. But God validated Jesus before Jesus done anything. So Jesus didn't feel like he needed to preach to get the Father's approval. He didn't feel like he needed to go on the worship team to get the Father's approval. Jesus was validated before he done anything. The Father is pleased with you before you serve him. He's pleased with you before you do anything for him. God was pleased with you as soon as you accepted his son. You've been saved by grace through faith, not by works. And without faith that God gave you, it's impossible to please him. So God has saved you. You don't have to work for his approval. He loves you. Am I making sense in here? 
Okay, so the foundation to get past immigration control, the foundation to get past temptation is to understand that your father approves of you, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Satan's going to use condemnation so that you can't pass the test. Your foundational stance when you're being questioned by Satan, when Satan says, if you're the son of God, you must be so resolved that God is pleased with you. Someone say, I'm approved. Someone say, I'm approved. Say, the father loves me. Say, I rebuke you, devil. We come against shame in the name of Jesus. In order for you to get out of your wilderness experience and walk into the promise, you have to realize there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Your sin doesn't define you. His righteousness defines you. That's number one. <laughs> That's a serious foundation if you want to pass and get into promise. All right, next one. Actually, let me give you proof quickly. 1 Peter 2, 21. I want to show you that, that Jesus gave us a key. 1 Peter 2, 21. For to this you have been called. Someone say called. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. Someone say example. Jesus left us an example so that we might follow in his steps. Jesus gave us an example so we can follow in his steps. He gave us an example in the wilderness on how to beat the devil. He gave us an example on how to get from process into promise. Let me ask you a question. Who was in the wilderness with Jesus? Who was in the wilderness with Jesus? Who was in the wilderness with him? The devil. Was there anyone else in the wilderness with Jesus? Was Mark there? Was Peter there? No one else was there, right? So how did the gospel writers know to put it inside the scriptures? You think it's the Holy Spirit? I think Jesus told this story to them. He, was, he felt obliged to tell them this story to say, put it inside the, the scriptures so these lot can get an example on how to beat the devil. No one was there with him. So there's a reason why it's inside the scriptures so we can follow his example. He's given us a template, a blueprint on how to beat the devil. How to get through border control into promise. Principle number two. The first thing we see in Matthew 4, we spoke about it just now, but the spirit of God left, led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. God is going to take every single believer to border control to process your identity. At this point in Jesus' life, he'd already been to church. Remember when Jesus was 12 years old, Jesus grew up in church, but he didn't know the wilderness. Some of you grew up in church. You have comfortability in church, comfortability with your church appearance, but you have to go into a place called process. So God allows Jesus to remove himself from, from religious approval, and he says, I'm going to take you to a place where Sunday best can't take you. I'm going to take you to a place where your two hours sitting on a seat cannot take you. So for the next 40 days, Jesus, I'm going to take you to an environment where only beasts eat. I'm going to take you to an environment where the lights are off, where it's dry. I'm going to take you to a place where human beings don't dare to go. You're going to have to be in this place with one eye open. Because I want to measure every single ounce of your surrender at border control. And I'm going to test you in every single way that you cannot be tested. And if you pass this test and walk out of the wilderness, you're going to walk out in power and in promise. Can I ask you, why do you keep walking away from promise? Why are you on fire one day and then not on fire the next? Why do you join the 6 a.m. prayer call and then hop off? Do you know why? It's because we like comfortability. We like, we like seasons of ease. And this season of ease becomes intoxicating. We take, a, we take a shot of ease every single morning. And it keeps us stuck at border control. But the blood of Jesus inside of you is different. It's going to deal with everything. Many people know what it's like to be delivered into salvation, but they don't know what it's like to be delivered into destiny. Am I in a Catholic church today? Listen, deliverance doesn't happen one time. Deliverance is an ongoing thing. There's so much more for you. We call it maturity. The wilderness is the place where God puts those who he is pleased with under a test. Maybe the reason right now why you're facing something is because God is pleased with you. Did you think about that? Maybe you're being tested because God is pleased with you. Now that sounds counterproductive, right? But nobody who gives their life to Jesus is going to have an easy life. The devil is the God of this world. We're in the world, not of the world. He said, in the world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. If you're in, in here and you're going through something, if, if you're in here and you're not going through something, maybe you're on the devil's side. The devil doesn't mess with people who are his property. But when, when, when a person shows up and that person pleases God, they go into process. God isn't trying to hurt you. God isn't trying to condemn you. 
He's trying to reveal the pain inside your identity to deal with it. Border control is going to ask you about your parents. They're going to ask you about your heritage. They're going to ask you about your ethnicity. They're going to ask about your upbringing. They're going to deal with your perspectives. They're going to deal with general, generational curse issues. That's what border control do. Where are you coming from? Who are you? They're going to continue to ask questions about your past. And if, you, if you're irritated at this immigration, if you're, Im if you're irritated at these questions, this interrogation, if you're, if you're irritated by this temptation, you're going to stay at border control. When you argue, argue with those who are checking your passport, they keep you there. When you argue with the devil, he keeps you there. And you prolong your entry into the kingdom and the promise. You're in the kingdom already, but you're just stuck at the airport. So God is giving you the opportunity to overcome. God is giving you the opportunity to overcome. You're going to be the first to get a mortgage. You're going to be the first to marry. You're going to be the first to have a healthy lifestyle. But you're only going to receive that if you enter into process. This won't continue with your children. You're going to have an amazing family. Poverty will be far from you. But that promise, that, that promise will only manifest if you go into process. Am I speaking in this church? Let me crack this open this way. I'm going to share a bit of my testimony, yeah? I'm going to give you something symbolically that I realized. I got saved. I had a honeymoon period with God. I was having testimonies upon testimonies. People were getting saved left, right, and center. Me and God were like hip and neck. He was just walking with me 24-7. <laughs> ben will remember this. I read Mark 16. There's a scripture in Mark 16 which speaks about you would drink no deadly poison and it won't harm you. I was allergic to nuts. You remember that? I, I, I jumped on Snapchat. I was allergic to nuts. I took that scripture by faith. Jumped on. Don't do it. Don't do it. I jumped on Snapchat. I broke open so many different types of nuts. Cashew nuts, this nut, that, and you ate, ate it. Allergy gone. I'm just showing you something. I'm showing you something. I had stupid faith. Dumb faith. But then one day I woke up and God, it felt like God wasn't with me. That, that overwhelming presence of him being, it was just gone. And I went on my knees, I was praying for like an hour, two hours until I could feel this goosebump. Do you know what I mean? I was just like, what's going on? Why can't I feel you? And slowly but surely, I started to lose my passion and my drive. I slowly started to get snappy with people and angry at people. And I fell back into masturbation and into dumb cycles because I felt like he weren't with me no more. I was trying to do things in my own strength. I remember there was an opportunity that came up. Ben, you're going to remember this one. An opportunity came up and this woman offered us an opportunity and... Everyone was like, oh, let's just pray about it. Let's just pray about it. And I was like, you guys are holding me back, man. I just want to go. Like, why are you not holding me back for? I was moving crazy. Like, I realized in the wilderness moment how foul I was. I felt so blessed when I came to the Lord. But in the wilderness, I realized, wait, you're still sinful. Am I making sense? The wilderness, God is trying to bring you back to show you, hey, don't be a Pharisee, brethren. You've still got some things inside you that need to be worked out. I became reacquainted with myself. I was so confused. And I didn't realize I was in the process. I began to see my ugly again. He was whipping the Pharisee and the pride out of me. He was humbling me. And I'm going to circle back to this. Let me bring it. Daniela just spoke about it. When we look at the Old Testament, we see the Exodus, yeah? The Exodus is symbolic of our story with Jesus. The Israelites are saved by the blood of Jesus being put on the doors, yeah? That's us at salvation. The Israelites leave Egypt with gold and silver. The Egyptians are giving the Israelites gold and silver. That's the honeymoon period where God is with you and everything's great. Testimonies upon testimonies. They go through the Red Sea. That's baptism. Then the Israelites end up in the wilderness. The exact same thing we go through. Jesus saves us. We have the honeymoon period. We go through baptism. Then we end up in the wilderness. You didn't realize why you're in a dry place. I'm coming to give you language today. The, the, the Israelites stayed in the wilderness for 40 years. Process. And that's where many of us are. Many of us get stuck in this place for so many years, walking around in circles around my, Mount Sinai, just walking around in circles, walking around in circles, doing the same thing over and over again, insanity, just walking around in circles. And we never walk into the promised land, but the promised land's right there. It's right there. We can get out. But we keep going in circles. Am I speaking? Am I speaking in it? God done something in the wilderness that God showed me. He rained down manna. What's manna? Bread. He rained it down every day. Give us this day our daily bread. That's the Bible. He didn't give them a loaf for a week. He gave them bread every single day. He said, come back every single day to come and get this bread. When you're in the wilderness, what do you need to do? Not rely on last, week, last Sunday. Get the bread every single day. Are you, am I making sense? He said, eat the manna every single day. Read the word every single day. Whilst you're in the wilderness, it is written has to come out your mouth. The issue with the Israelites is they didn't want to eat the manna. 
Likewise, many of us can't process out of border control and it's because we're not speaking scripture at our test. All we do is complain like the Israelites. And what we do is we look at our past and we keep looking over our shoulder and we want to jump on the plane back to our past just like the Israelites. Why did you bring us into this wilderness? Are you all right? You cool? <sighs> we stay in the wilderness and we want to go back to Egypt's bondage. We want to go back to the past. I'm giving you a, a blueprint here on how to get out. Am I speaking in this place? I just need to know. Raise your hands if I'm speaking to you. All right, cool. We run back to weed. We run back to comfort. We run back to our past. We run back to our ex-lover. And this is where God says, I'd rather you hot or cold. This one foot in, one foot out business, like it, it's not what God wants. And you're not going to get promised by doing that. You, you come into border control, see him. Oh yeah, let me go back to the past quickly. Oh yeah, hey, ask me questions. Let me go back to the past quickly. Pass the test, you get into promise. Lord, is this a heavy one? All right, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let me bring it back to my story. It felt like God was holding my hand everywhere I was going. Honeymoon period, everything's great. Then he brought me to the wilderness. And do you know what it's like? You know when, the, when, when your parent is teaching you to ride a bike and they put stabilizers on the bike? The wilderness was where God took the stabilizers off my bike and he said, just ride. He let go of my hand. He said, just ride. I trust you. I've given you everything that you need to do to get out of this situation. If you're in the wilderness, God trusts you to ride your bike. He trusts you to fall over and get back up. Fall over, get back up. He's watching you as a father. Am I making sense in this place? He says, I've given you everything you need to get out of this test. You're my child. Go for it. Don't rely on last week's Sundays. No, no. Feed yourself daily bread. You're my child. And this is where many of us go wrong. Because we don't follow that protocol, we go around in circles around Mount Sinai. The promised land's right there. We can get out. But because we don't go through Jews' process, we're stuck in cycles. The Israelites were stuck there 40 years. We get, Jesus was stuck there 40 days. And this is where it gets deeper. Moses freed them and put them into the wilderness. He put them in the wilderness, but he didn't deal with their mentality. He put them in a new place, but they still had a slave mentality. Jesus has taken you somewhere, but you still have your old mentality. Am I making sense inside here? Freedom isn't a location, it's a mentality. Let me come down here. Freedom isn't a location, it's a mentality. I can, I, I can do something in London as, as a gang member, and I can run away to another location, but my gang member mentality still follows me. I can hurt someone now. I can go to another country, and the murder that I committed still stays inside my mind. I'm getting nightmares. Freedom isn't a place, it's inside your mind. Am I making sense? Are you sure I'm making sense? All right, so the wilderness is where he's trying to deal with your mindset. He's trying to deal with your mindset. I can go to Barbados with a hoodman mentality and it still follows me. The spirit of God takes you out the wilderness. Yeah, you with me? He takes you from your past, puts you in the wilderness. And like Israel, a lot of Christians stay there because they still have a slave mentality. God is saying in the wilderness, if you don't get underneath this process and renew your mind, you're going to be bound and stuck in cycles at border control. You can't be crowned in royalty if you have a slave mentality. Am I making sense in this place? Please listen to the words that I'm speaking. Please. It might sound like a double-edged sword, but it's good for your refinement. Please receive this, yeah? I've got this revelation yeah i stopped reading my bible in the wilderness because i wanted god's goosebump beyonce gives me goosebumps why am i relying on the goosebump raise your hands if you have wanted god's goosebump before god was processing me then to worship him outside of my feelings he was processing me to say don't wait for lightning to come inside your room he was disciplining me the wilderness is a place of discipline to process your identity. He was processing me to worship him outside of my feelings. To worship him in the rain, in the storm, in the thunder. He wanted me to worship in all circumstances. You're being processed to see how you continue to worship. And feelings is what God is stripping you away from inside the wilderness. Satan wants you to whine. He wants you to fear. He wants you to doubt. But the wilderness is training your mind to rely on it is written. Jesus had feelings. He was hungry, but it is written. Okay, so anyway, God gave me a very profound dream for how I came out of the wilderness. And he showed me that he was still with me. I had a dream of a lion on my chest. And God was showing me, I'm still with you in the wilderness. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, fear no evil, for thou art with me. 
in the pain, God was showing me, I'm still with you. I'm your father just watching you ride your bike. I haven't gone anywhere. I'm just letting you go. Am I making sense? So lesson three. So, no, no, that was lesson two. Back into the wilderness you go. Look at this. For every year Israel spent in the wilderness, Jesus spent one day. Israel spent 40 years, Jesus spent 40 days. Every single year the Israelites spent, Jesus spent one day. Do you know what that means? When you're processed, you can cut your time in half. A processed person can get things done much quicker than it takes someone who, 15 years. If you go into process, you can get things done so much quicker. I'm not trying to boast here. I've been saved four years. Five years in October. By the grace of God, I'm shepherding people. I'm not boasting. Hear what I'm saying? The reason why only four years into my salvation, into my conversion, I'm here is because of process. Am I making sense inside the church? It doesn't matter how long you attend church. It matters if you go into process. It matters if you pass border control. What took Israel 40 years took Jesus 40 days because of the power of process. And God wants to know what you're going to do at temptation. He wants to know what you do in the storm. He wants to know what you do when you lose that job and you're losing your spouse and you're going broke. He wants to see the real you. And the real you shows up when you're angry at God and you're angry at the world and you don't even know why you're going through what you're going through. God needs to see how you handle betrayal. He needs to see how you handle pain. God doesn't want to customize you. He wants to real you. He wants to see how you handle fear. Lesson four. One of the keys for Jesus' victory was the power of fasting. Raise your hands if you like to fast. You do? Wow. Fasting is almost a taboo in this generation, yeah? And it's because we like to feed our flesh. But Jesus beat his body into submission. He put his emotions on pause. He said, listen, and I need to tell you something. Your consecration must be updated. Your prayer life must be updated. Your seek must be updated. The only people who don't feel like they need an updated consecration are those who grew up in church and feel like, you know what? I was just here from thingy and I don't really need to change or anything like that. But everyone has to go into process. Fasting is one of the most excruciating processes that we have to go through, denying our body so that we can give space to God, removing our phone and pillow talk so we can dedicate time to God. We don't just get saved and go straight into, pro in, into purpose. We get saved and go straight into process. You may have potential, but that doesn't mean that you're ready. We need discipleship. We need discipline. Because going through a cycle, who, who has been through a cycle? It's not a repentance issue. No, sorry, it's not a deliverance issue. It's a repentance issue. It's changing your mind. You know, we see things like daily prayer and discipline as legalism. We see it as works. We love grace and we think grace allows us to just abuse things and become lazy Christians. But listen, hmm. we don't wake up at six for, for morning prayer because it doesn't take all of that. But if Jesus was full of grace and truth, why did he pray every single morning? Was he a legalist? It's discipline. Someone say discipline. We don't teach discipline. We don't teach discipline. We just do happy-go-lucky Christianity and then we go through things and then we run away again because we don't know discipline. A disciple. Disciple comes from the word discipline. We must go through process. You know insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. I don't want to decree it, but some of us have a spirit of insanity. Your process begins today in Jesus' name. You won't be one foot, one foot in, one foot out no more in Jesus' name. You're not going to be deceived enough to say you're part of the kingdom, but bound enough to represent the kingdom. It's not going to happen no more. We're not going to sing songs we don't live. We're not going to hang, we're not going to hang on by a friend. It ends today. It ends today in Jesus' name. You know, I'm learning that most people overestimate the quality of their foundation in Jesus. Most people try to force their way into promise that they're not prepared for. You, you, let me tell you something. Let me tell, wait, let me tell you something about me, because you might be thinking this is a hard saying. Let me say something about me. I don't care about church numbers. Hear me. I don't care about church numbers. You may be feeling like, you know what, I want to go. No, dude, this is too heavy for me to hear. I'm, I'm sorry. The word of God is the word of God. Yeah? If you don't like it, it's fine. Once you've walked inside here, you're in the kitchen. You don't like the fire? Because I want to say this. Inadequate teaching... Poor devotion, horrible spiritual leadership, no community, in inconsistent study habits, no deliverance, no discipleship, no fasting is what lends to a poor foundation. 
Your experiences as a believer does not make a quality foundation. And the truth is most, belie most believers are one struggle away, one storm away from becoming who they were before they got saved. God is laying deeper foundations in every single person's life to make you handle promise. Lesson five. At the end of this fast, all right, let's get happy. Let's get happy a little bit. Let me bring you up. At the end of this fast, yeah, Satan comes. And you know what makes me laugh? The uh, makes me laugh. The Bible gives Satan different nicknames. The adversary, the accuser, roaring lion. And I know Satan likes these names because it makes Satan seem like a bad man. But I love how Isaiah says it. Is this the one who makes the nation tremble? You know when we see Satan, he's going to look like Spongebob. He's going to look soft, moist, wet. When we, when we actually see Satan for what Satan looks like, he's going to look wet. Like a shrimp, a crab. Satan loves those names, accuser, roaring lion, because it makes him seem bad. Yeah? The Bible calls him in Matthew 4, the tempter. And Jesus gives us wisdom when he teaches us prayer. Deliver us from evil and lead us not into temptation. When you pray, ask to not be led into temptation. I beg I beg, yeah? I'm trying to give you every single trick in the book so that you don't fall out of process. Temptation is going to forever be inside your life. You must be taught on how to handle temptation because temptation will ruin your process. You know if you scream, Lord, use me, you're going to be tested. When you're singing worship songs, it's like, oh, I'm just singing it out for the... For the you're going to be tested because God's going to make sure to see if you're integral. He's going to allow that decision that you said to see if it's intact. He's going to make something walk up in your face. You said, Lord, use me. He's going to put something inside your face. And you know what? At border control, he's going to let a woman of the night walk past you. And he's going to see what you do. I said that. He's going to see what you do. He's going to let a beautiful chocolate man walk past your face and see what you do. As soon as you say, Lord, use me, expect temptation. You know, you know we're all free as long as that person's not my type. The devil knows your type. He, know, he knows what you like. And you can't say you're in freedom because, oh yeah, everyone around me isn't pretty. The moment a painting walks up on you with hips and dips and thighs and eyes and all of that, when you're weak in your knees and you can hardly speak and the flesh is raging and you want some, let's be real inside this place today. It's not until you see it and you can say no that you qualify for the promise. Listen, you can want it, but don't let what you want win. I said, don't let what you want win. It's okay to want it. I get it. You're human. You have desires. Do you know what I mean? But the promise manifests. You see, when it's in your face and you lick your lips and you say, Mandem, help me out. Mandem, help me out. Hey, you're trying to take me out of process. I need to go and pray quickly. You see what I'm saying? God wants to see if you're going to choose him. If you can't pass GCSE, you're not going into college. How would you overcome the test? Last, let me, let me say this. Let me press this. So many of us want a person yeah we, we want a person for a lifetime but you may not know that the person that you like is only there for a season you're growing you're growing up you don't even know yourself yet your id hasn't been processed yet so we make lifelong commitments whilst we're still at border control we make lifelong commitments to a person when we don't know ourselves yet but when we get the promise of god and god has processed our identity our taste buds change our appetites change, our interests change, and the person that you liked no longer follows what you like. You're no longer compatible, unequally yoked. Oh, Lord. God, God picks a spouse for your future. We pick a spouse for our present. I, that, that one felt good, you know. That one, that one felt good. Yo. We make lifelong decisions whilst we're at border control. And you know what it's all about? It's about your appetite. Someone say appetite. Lesson number six. The first attack of the devil was one of hunger. He says, if you're hungry, consume this thing that you shouldn't eat. Eat this rock. It's not bread. Eat this rock. Consume it. I love food, yeah? When I don't have food, I get evil. Hunger. Hunger will interrupt your path. Yeah, I could be on a journey somewhere, my belly starts growling, and I wouldn't usually hit McDonald's, but as soon as I get hungry, please believe I'm interrupting my journey and making a U-turn. Hunger makes you make U-turns. You could be craving some cuddle time right now, and that craving will make you make a U-turn. The Bible says in Matthew 5, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It matters what you fill yourself with. Satan wants to know what satisfies you. If you want to be filled with lust, then go on with your bad self. 
will be here to help you when you're ready to stop. But let me tell you something, there's no such thing as a sudden fall. There's no such thing as a sudden fall. There's been signs, there's been signals, there's been alarms. You know that you're going to fall, but you walk. no one just slips into someone. under this word sit under this word it is it's, it's desire desire needs training do you know what we do we allow our desires to control us you know my desires got in the way it just happened listen i have a wedding to pay i have a desire to go and rob a house and clean it out i have a desire i'm not gonna kill anyone i just want to stick them up so i can get what i need i'm not am i gonna do it no because my desires don't tell me what to do no matter how strong my desire is, no matter how repetitive it is, it, it doesn't dictate my behavior. Hmm. God doesn't want us eating rocks at the check-in. He wants us eating daily bread. There's a daily, daily test for your hunger. A daily test for what you're going to do when you're starved. L lesson seven. I love this. Remember the very last thing that Jesus heard the Father say. This is my son whom I love. This is my son. This is my son. This is my son. That was the last thing God said. This is my son. This is my son. This, the last prophetic word was, this is my son. The last prophetic word, my son. He gets a prophetic word before he gets to border control. And the prophetic, the prophetic word, does, you, you know, like, so, have you ever received a prophetic word and it didn't, didn't mean anything in that moment? As soon as Jesus got to border control, that prophetic word made sense. If you're the son of God. Didn't God just say, this is my son? As soon as he got to border control, if you're the son of God. God always gives us a prophetic word before something happens. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. We're going to make this make sense. This is what God does. A teacher can't test you on information you haven't been taught yet. You can't go into a test. A teacher will not allow you to go into a test if you have not been taught the information. God knows that you have all the information that you need to pass your test. Some of us are in a test and we think it's unfair, but I promise you, you've been given all the information you need to get out of it. You've been qualified enough to get past border control. You have enough information to pass the test. So anyway, God gives Jesus this prophetic word. This is my son. What's the first thing that Satan attacks when he's processing Jesus' passport? Identity. If you're the son of God. The devil always attacks the last thing God said over you. If you don't understand why you're in a test, I beg, look at the last prophetic word you received. You may not know why you're going through a test because you haven't gone back to the last thing God said. The devil always attacks the last thing God said. God says to Adam and Eve, do not eat the fruit from this tree or you'll die. What does Satan say? You won't die if you eat the fruit from this tree. He always attacks the last thing God says. Am I making sense in this Catholic church? So Satan attacks our doubts. He makes God look like a liar. And you know God isn't watching, at what, he, God, God isn't watching what Satan's doing. He's watching your response. God isn't looking at what Satan's doing when he's tempting you. God is watching you and watching your response. It's the father that's watching their child ride without the stabilizers. He's watching you. He wants to know if in the middle of the crisis, when you're being accused by Satan, you're going to have an it is written come out of your mouth. God wants to know if you're going to pick him over your feelings. Your feelings don't know the future. God knows who you're going to be in five years. Your feelings don't know that. Place your hand on your chest. And I want you to think about the greatest promise of God over your life. And I want you to shout out, I believe him. Come on, open your mouth. I believe God. Keep on saying until the devil screams, stop. I believe God. I believe God alcohol. I believe God divorce. I believe God cancer. I believe God, oh my days. Shout out, I believe him. I believe God cancer. Shout out, I believe him. Believe God through the pain. Believe God through the pressure. I'm making a choice to believe God. Right now, it's being recorded in heaven and it's being recorded on earth. It's being recorded in hell. I believe God. Lesson eight. Lesson eight. The Bible says after that temptation of hunger didn't work, Satan attacks Jesus with another question. You know, Satan wants to take you out more than you realize. He's more committed to your identity than you are. 
He desires to sift you like wheat. Now here's the process. When one area is tested and you pass one test, please believe there's another test coming around the corner. You may pass one, tem one temptation, it unlocks you to another level. You know, I heard something on Friday about my sister. I got over it. Then on Saturday, a black Hebrew Israelite came to me and told me I'm going home because I don't worship on the Sabbath. Then on the Sunday, someone really got on my nerves in the church. Then Tuesday came and there was a spider infestation in my mum's house. Then I got three points of my license. Then I had sleep paralysis on the Friday. Then my spouse got COVID. So has anyone in here been through a simultaneous test? Let me tell you a secret. Swing at me once, I'll praise God. Swing at me twice, I'll praise God. Swing at me and try and take me out and there are intercessors praying over me. You can't kill me. Satan can keep attacking, but I'm going to keep on switching my response so Satan gets confused. You thought you can get me out of this test the same way you did last time, but I'm so flexible, I'm challenging, and I'm trying another warfare tactic. I'm not always going to run back to what I did last time. I'm going to switch up on Satan so he gets confused. Sometimes we're in cycles because we stay the same. We're so predictable. We, 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 we do our faith journey in isolation, and we don't have no level of accountability, so we stay in cycles. But I dare you over the next hundred days to give the devil a response that he wasn't expecting. I dare you to do the opposite of what, what you usually do. Because at new levels, there's new devils. I know that's not scripture, but it's a fact. Every single thing that you go through, the challenge is deeper. So if you would normally be sad, be happy. If you would normally not come to church, then come to church and do crazy praise. Turn to someone and say, do the opposite. Say, do the opposite. Victory comes to those who don't let Satan figure them out. Am I speaking in this church? Lesson nine. He says the hunger didn't work. Let me take you to the top of this temple. Let me do something that makes you look like you're going to be promoted. Let me give you visibility. Let me give you preferential treatment and favor. You know, your views online are going to start doing well. People are going to comment all over your posts and give you so many likes. You're going to feel so great. You know, everybody's going to know you. You're going to get invitations to the prayer breakfast. Let me take you to the top. Some of you are in a test right now to see what you'll do if you'll sell out to be famous. Some of you want popularity amongst church people so much that, and it's not even going to last. But I dare you to not try and get your validation from people. I dare you to go into your closet and pray in secret so the Father can reward you publicly. I dare you. I double dare you to not get validation from people. The devil takes him to the top of the temple and let's look at verse 6 please. He says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. He basically says, have a fall. Let's not dig into that. Verse 7, Jesus said to him again, it is written, you should not put the Lord your God to the test. Hmm. You sh it is written. Can I just reiterate something quickly? If you don't have enough Bible to throw back at the devil, you're not going to pass. Worship songs won't get you into promise. Knowing what just happened with Chandler Lamore won't get you into pro promise. Knowing what happened on Instagram won't get you into promise. Border control doesn't care about your, what you know. They care about your response, which is, it is written. Thy word have I hidden in my heart. Not my opinions, not my thoughts, not my zodiac sign, not my views. Thy word I've hidden in my heart. How much of the Bible you know will get you through process. Sorry, I'm hot up here. So, Lesson 10, verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Uh, uh. Satan's going to try and offer you the easy option. He starts getting desperate. I can give you a great career, you know. What degree do you want, Jesus? Who do you want to marry? The Bible talks about where a man's treasures are. That's where his heart is. God is testing your motives as he processes your ID. He'll place you on the mountain and he'll say, let me give you all these kingdoms and their glory. Let me, let me, let me give you a quick testimony in this dry place so you feel like I've taken you out. Bite the bait. But how many of you, you know, not everything that's good actually comes from God? And here's why, verse 9, he said to him, all these I'll give you. Satan can give you success. I'm talking to you. The devil will promote you. He can, the devil can send you a man. The devil can send you a woman. Just because it's good doesn't mean it's God. He can send you something so good to bring you out of process. You think it's God. You think it's God. It looks like God, but it's not God. Oof, am I speaking? The devil wants to give you something prematurely. He says to Jesus, I will give you all the kingdoms and their glory. Jesus was going to get all the kingdoms anyway. He was going to be king of kings and lord of lords. Satan offered it to Jesus prematurely. 
So many of us accept premature blessings. Am I speaking in this church? Someone shout amen. Let me know that you guys are with me. Now here's the point, verse 9. And he said to him, all, they, all these I'll give you if you just fall down and worship me. The final test that border control is where your obedience is. Worship isn't just a slow song. Worship isn't you lifting your hearts. A lot of people lift their hands and their hearts are black. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. A lot of people worship, but they don't actually walk in obedience and submission. A lot of people worship, the Bible says, leave your sacrifice at the altar, go and be reconciled and come back and worship. Worship is all about your heart posture. It's not about you lifting your hands and you singing on the mic. I don't care for anyone that sings up here, up here you know. Like, I'm not saying that I don't care for them. But I'm saying that you can come up here, sing to the Lord all you want, but your heart might not be right up here. Just because you're, you're a worship leader doesn't mean you're worshiping God properly. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? You can't be a disobedient worshiper. If God told you to do something last year and you're dragging your feet, are you actually worshiping? You know there's a word, avodah zara. Avodah zara is a Hebrew word. It's the Hebrew word for worship. It's the Hebrew word for work. It's the Hebrew word for serve. serve. Yeah? Worship. Worship. Yeah? You shall worship the Lord your God. Worship. That's avodah zara. He says, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. The word serve, it's avodah. Yeah? He says, for six days you shall work. Work is the same word, avodah. Work, service, and worship are all the same thing. How you work, do it to the glory of God. How you serve, do it to the glory of God. How you, how, you, how you lift your hands here, do it to the glory of God. All of it's worship. Lesson 11. We're wrapping up. Jesus responds. You say amen. <laughs> Jesus responds in verse 10. Be gone, Satan. Someone say be gone. Be gone, Satan, for it is written. Be gone, Satan, for it is written. Jesus says, good try. I know whose I am. And I know that I can get into promise. And Jesus responds to him and says, You shall worship, worship the Lord your God, and only him shall you serve. I, I, I cast out demons through teaching. I don't need to lay my hands on you and do spiritual circus in order for a demon to come up. Come out. Warfare is a mindset thing. It's not you're screaming, you're shouting, you're shofar, you're waving the flag. That's not warfare. That's you exerting energy. We warfare from the spirit. We don't warfare from the flesh. You're jumping around and doing praise and victory laps isn't doing much. I cast out demons through teaching. Warfare is a mindset. Here's the maddest thing when it comes to your identity. When an unclean spirit comes out of a man, it wanders through dry places so he can rest. And finding none, it goes back to that temple to find it swept clean and garnished. Then it goes back and gets seven spirits more wicked than itself. And the state of that person is worse than the first. If the devil could preach, I'm pretty sure he'd say you're silly because you're going through process by yourself. Even the devil knows the power of numbers. When you're at immigration control and you're beating the devil, guess what he goes and does? Seven spirits more wickeder. But we, with all of our trust issues, go into process by ourselves, all alone, not sharing our weaknesses with other people. But the devil's smarter because every single time he's coming to attack you, he goes and gets seven people wickeder. If Satan knows the power of numbers, why do we do Christianity by ourselves? How many of you have ever seen something cross your screen online and you know you're about to go onto that link and you shouldn't and then your friend rings your phone? Has that happened to anyone? Your friend just saved your life. It's called accountability. Don't do your Christian journey by yourself. It, it, it actually frustrates me so much when people do Christianity by themselves. You're on your way to falling. There's a difference between being a private person and a secret person. One person protects themselves, the other person is hiding. What are you doing today? I'm going to go and meet Andrew, then I'm going to... And you don't tell me that you're actually going to go meet that girl. And you say, oh, I'm going to go meet Andrew, then I'm going home. And you didn't tell me that you're going to go meet the girl. Secrets. Secrecy is where sin is bred. And what we do, I'm sorry, do you know what? I have to be heavy, I'm sorry. We, we'd rather be around people who have the same addictions as us. But you have to have friends who are more mature than you. If you want cheerleaders, go and play, play sports. The ministry of friendship is maturity. We only have friends that do the same things as us. The same bondage. So when we speak about our issues, oh yeah, I'm going through it as well, you know. You're not getting, you're not, you're not getting delivered.
I'm trying to get you into your promise. We talk about, oh, I'm around these people because I'm the only saved one. I just feel like I'm supposed to be the difference. You haven't even passed border control yet. You've been saved 20 seconds. You spent 10, 10 of those seconds in prayer. Now you're going back to do good in the hood. And you're trying to lead people from darkness into light when you haven't even got the promise of light yet. God's real, pro- God's real problem is this. He can't get Christians to stop justifying carnality at border control. Mm. This, this is a character issue. God wants to process you and your vulnerability. The problem with our life is our character. The problem with our potential is our character. Who here can stand it when people come up to them and say, hey, you have so much potential? Do you know how much that must frustrate a person who's not walking in their, their potential? You're reminding me of my potential because you keep running away from it. People won't speak to you about your potential if you weren't running. And people can't stand the greatness that they haven't reached yet because they won't go through process to get into promise. <laughs> hey, this setting my face on flint business is mad, you know. What's in the way of our potential? This is just how I am. This is just how I am. And that's why people don't get ahead. That's why relationships are failing because stubbornness is rejecting our process. And the next 48 hours, God is going to deal with your disciplines. People only backslide because they won't allow God to process them. There are people inside this room right now who have made the decision that I'm going anywhere but back. I can't stand going through cycles. I'm going forward. Pride is what makes us fall, but deception is what keeps us falling. God wants to break us out of border control. He wants wants us to walk in the freedom because we can no longer stay bound by border control. Satan robs our identity. This isn't about gifts. This is about identity. And there are places God wants to take us in the kingdom that our attitude isn't ready for. There are doors God wants to open for us, but our loving hip-hop self isn't ready for it. But I believe God is trying to take you out of focusing on yourself and focusing on him. And this is what David did at border control. Despite David's fall with Bathsheba, despite Absalom turning against David, beside, beside Saul trying to kill David, David said something at border control, I will bless the Lord. At all, at all. Now this scripture has a different meaning. I will bless the Lord when I have friends. I will bless the Lord when I don't have friends. I'll bless the Lord when someone walks away. I'll bless the Lord when I have money. I'll bless the Lord when I'm broke. I'll bless the Lord when I feel defeated. I'll bless the Lord when I'm sick. There will never be a time when something out of my mouth makes me run away from process. Praise keeps me in perspective. If I praise him, I'm reminded about God's integrity. If I talk about the goodness and mercy and grace of God, I can talk about, God, you did it for them and I know you're going to do it for me. In my process, nothing hits heaven like a, like, like, like a process person. God loves a process person. When you show your content, I'll praise him in process. I'll dance in process. I'll sing in process. Now, stand to your feet for me, please. I want to show you something that Jesus did when he walked out of the wilderness. Raise your hands. Was that word for anyone inside this room? Was it a bit too much? You didn't like it? Raise your hands if you didn't like it. Be real with me. You didn't like it. Let me know. I just want to see by a show of hands who didn't like that word. Be honest. No? I I mean, you know what I mean. It is what it is. The Bible shows us when Jesus went into the wilderness filled by the Spirit. Jesus went into the wilderness filled by the Spirit. But I love how Luke 4 explains it. Can I get Luke 4 as we close? Luke 4, 15. Luke 4, 14. Sorry. And Jesus returned in the power. Someone say power. Jesus went in filled with the Spirit, but he returned out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. Being full of the Spirit is what God gives you in order for you to overcome your test. When you pass your test, you're now walking in the power of the Spirit. You want to walk into promise? You want to walk into process? It's only until Jesus walked out of the wilderness that the devil said, I know who you are, the Holy Son of God. Pass your test, the devils know your name. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. He won't even say, who are you? Because you pass process. Close your eyes, please. Jesus rose up every single day to maintain his posture. After Jesus walked out of the wilderness, he still went to pray every single morning. He passed the test, but he continued his discipline. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray for your sons and daughters. Father, I pray, Lord, that many of us have been trapped in the wilderness. Father, we've been judging people. We've been cynical. We've been sinful. Father God, we felt condemnation. We felt hurt. 
Father, we've been attacked by the devil and we've said it's you doing it to us. But Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, Father, that your people would be able to endure the test. Heavenly Father, I pray they would pass with flying colors. Father, I pray that you would build them up in such a way, Lord, that as they pass border control and walk into promise, Father God, their name would be written in bright lights. Father, I pray heaven would record their name. Father, I pray demons would record their name. Father, I pray that they would let their light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify you. Father, I pray these ones will not put their tails between their legs and, and tone down the fire that you've placed within them. I pray against false humility in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray they would learn you as you are in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father, I really do believe that the Lord is doing a work in many people inside this room. And as you begin to sit underneath this word, there are certain things that you've been feeling like you've been in cycles about. But I believe the Lord is about to fast track you in Jesus' name. The Lord is about to fast track you. When you actually process your identity, God is going to show you everything that happened in your past that brought you to this place. God is going to do a work inside of you. Some of you are running back to ex-lovers. Some of you are running back to weed. Some of you are running back to these things to gratify yourself. But I believe the Lord is coming to say, listen, let me fill that place. Let me give you the strength to pass border control. Don't rely on your own strength. Rely on my grace. The Lord is coming to build you and break you out of the bondage and the chains of border control. You will no longer be interrogated by the devil. When the devil tries to interrogate you, you will say, shut up, devil. You're coming to a place where you're going to have authority over unclean spirits in the name of Jesus. You're coming to a place where you're going to break your daddy's devils in the name of Jesus. You're coming to a place where your household is going to be saved in the name of Jesus. You're coming to a time where you're going to walk in the promise of the spirit in the name of Jesus. God is going to do a work in every single life inside this room so, so much as you go into process. Now I'm going to ask you to do something. Don't feel condemnation today feel conviction let conviction have its work don't feel condemnation i'm going to ask you a question if you're willing to go into process if you're not willing don't worry it's okay don't feel mad don't get on your knees if you're not willing i'm going to ask you to get on your knees if you're willing to go into process if you're not willing don't do it if you are willing do it don't do it because everyone around you is doing it do it if you feel like you need to do it Right now, right now, surrender your need to argue with the devil. Surrender your need to have control over your life. Surrender your need to walk in your feelings. Surrender all of those things and begin to release yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, help me break out so I can go into promise. I'm going to ask you to begin to pray. Begin to pray. Begin to pray. I'm not going to encourage you in this. This is for you to do.